there are some people sitting somewhere in the organization, and sometimes at a certain point they have this kind of you know boom moment when they say like, oh yes, we need to pursue a new idea, a new business idea that we need to develop, and they start from here, right? We got an idea, and what happened next? That normally they have a project manager that got assigned to this idea in order to develop it. And what is happening next is that we have sometimes one but sometimes a group of designers that start working around this new idea. And what happened next? Well, those designers are working together, or sometimes they work alone, and they produce a design specification. So a set of things like Sometimes it's a mock-up, I mean, most of the time it's a static mock-up. And when this is, let's say, is mature enough, they got approval, it's thrown to the other side to a team of developers. And, you know, developers are receiving this, and they say, well, oh, well, since we are, we are an agile team, because we have all those things like, you know, backlog tickets, we have daily startups, we have Jira and all those things, but when we take this, and we will do something, we will go now, we're gonna start working until at a certain point we have something ready. We have something that is done, it's ready for it to be shipped on production. And only at this point, and okay, this is, takes a while, the users are getting what the original idea was, what is actually the, the representation, I mean the value that was conceived at the beginning. And normally at this stage, what is happening is that the project manager, the designers, and even the development team, they are already shifted to a new thing. They are already thinking about a new product, they are getting a new count from the, from the Geo platform, and they are already projected to do something. So when you have the users receiving this kind of uh, the, the product that has been told at the beginning, all those people are already somewhere else. And I don't know if this is familiar for you, does it, does it resonate? Ah, uh, yeah, it's in many times. And this thing has a name actually, you know, it's called the water scrum form. So, half more form, sometimes scrum, but yeah, it has a name, you know. And every time I see something like that, a client implemented, like I see people working like this, I'm super sad. <laughs> and I say like, oh my god, I'm so sad that I was actually struggling to to pick the right image that can represent the sadness I have. Because, well, I tried for my entire career to shift the approach that we have when we are thinking about design digital stuff from a rigid plan-driven process to something that let's say is more adaptive, is embracing the change, and it takes people at the center. It takes people as a first class citizens. So, this is my goal, this is my personal goal, this is my mission, this is the thing I would like to implement every time I'm going to a new organization. And those are a few words about me. Uh, well, my name is Matteo, Matteo Gavucci, I am Italian and I live in Berlin, Germany. I used to work for this consultancy firm called Thoughtworks, I'm independent. And what I'm doing normally is working together uh, with executives and managers and team members in order to rethink the way they're producing digital products. So instead of having this water scrum folder that I really hate, what I would like to see, what I would like to find when I go to, to my clients is something like that. You know, it's a group of people that comes from very different backgrounds that shares very different skills, that we are actually able to work together as a single team, as a single entity, able to change something and working towards a common goal. And their job is basically creating things through experiments, through adding things in front of the people and getting their feedback and getting, and I mean, inspecting what is happening on the real world and be driven by this flow of information that is constantly going. And you know, when you have more than one team and you need to have all those people aligned toward a common direction, well, we need something like a strategy. And the role of the strategy here is not limiting what 
need, we need to produce. It's not about telling people what they have to do, but it's more about giving them a direction, a sort of compass, a sort of collective uh, goal, so people can take their own decisions. And those people are somehow influencing in a continuous circle, in a continuous loop, how the strategy will be deployed. And, on the other side, a very important component of this way of making things is the fact that those people, they are very close to the, to the users, so they are developing a sort of relationship, very close relationship with the, you know, with the final users. Well, they need to be empowered, they need to be enabled, they need to have the right tools and the right way so they can actually focus on the real things, on the things that matter. And this is one of the key elements of, that can actually allow us to have to balance those different points, those different points that is having a very strong local autonomy. So those people can take the best decisions because they are very close to the users and they can actually listen to them very, very closely. And on the other side, we can keep a global consistency product-wise. We have a, a sort of alignment, very strong alignment, and we can actually see things happening and going together in the same direction. And you see here that if we start thinking of design as something that will produce design enablers, well, we can think about design as a design as a service. So as something that will serve other people in order to create competitive products. And in a nutshell, this is the essence of design ops. So the I mean the capacity for people to establish this continuous conversation, the fact that they can produce something and listen for feedback, this continuous ongoing ex exchange of knowledge, of information that flows from a team to the consumer, to the users and back. And I mean, I know that there is some confusion around this topic, around this term, design ops, because you know, many people think, oh well, yeah, we heard about design ops, and design ops is about design systems. Yeah, isn't it pretty much design systems? And is it equal pretty much to pattern libraries? And somehow, you know, it's about the style guides? Well, this equation, uh, it's very common. Like, if you start asking with people saying, oh, yes, I'm doing design ops, and what they're practically doing is sometimes it's just, you know, style guides and pattern libraries. But let me give you another, let's say, mathematical example here to uh, explain better how, how I think design ops. Well, I think that design ops is, to design system, what DevOps is to pipeline. So, it's just a component that makes this broader idea, this bigger idea, alive. And yes, I mean, design systems are very important, but design ops is somehow incorporating the why is important, what is giving us, what is actually, what makes us possible. And I don't know how many of you have heard about DevOps. How many of you are familiar with the concept of DevOps? Oh, great, that side here, wow. So, uh, I think that DevOps is a huge revolution in the field that we are doing, because I, I assume that pretty much here are doing software. And when we are talking about DevOps, we are not just talking about how easy it is to ship code directly from production, how we can automate the process. This is just a tough thing to be how. But the real power of DevOps is the fact that we can actually establish this constant feedback loop between the team and what they produce and how the users are using the thing that they are making. And this is great because it means that we are creating a sort of direct connection, again, between the team and the users. And we can monitor it if something gets wrong, if we have an error, if something gets mad in production, well, we can fix it. And we can fix it in minutes, by an hour. We don't have to wait the next release. We are not anchored to some kind of, you know, industrial rhythm. We can fix them, we can listen how things are performing live, and we can fix it if they break. And, I mean, the essence, I think, the essence of DevOps is definitely this. It's realizing that speed and quality are the opposite that we can have both, that it's actually possible 
to have something that is fast, is delivering fast value, and is solid, is good enough to be shown to the people, to the users. And you know, you can appreciate this. I think that is uh, going to looking at the way software products are made and compared how industrial products are made, you see the difference. So you see that if you are making a mistake on designing a physical product, and then we are actually noticing that there is a mistake on the original design, well, in order to fix it, we need to go through a bloody expensive recall campaign. So we need to send out all the information, we need to get all the products back, and we need to pay back all the people for uh, well, yeah, for, for the problem, for the issues. While, when we have a software product, something that is made with software, well, it's soft. And if we are noticing that something is broken, we can set up a patch, the minute after we notice it. And if we are developing this constant ability to check what's going on in the user size, well, we can intercept issues and we can fix it blazing fast. And this is somehow influencing also the way we are thinking about design. Because since now, and I mean for most of our dictionaries, I see that there is still limit the process that comes from, I mean, from the traditional design. So something that starts with framing the problem and then gets into ideation and then gets into specification and at the same time I mean, needs to stop because those specifications need to be fixed in order to start production and then be delivery. Well, what design, well, what digital products are enabling us is somehow moving away from this paradigm, from the fact that we have a certain moment where we need to stop ideation and we need to start with production and delivery. We can implement this constant conversation driven by feedback while we are making something and we are assessing if we are on the right path. We are making something and we see that if we are delivering then you are not. And I said, this is somehow the core of the idea of the line of center. A while ago people were asking me, well, let's find out what could be a solid definition for the world, for the design ops. Because I mean, somehow it needs to be an umbrella term for a lot of things. And what I found can be useful to navigate into, into this paradigm is the fact that design ops is a set of cultural choice, part of a cultural shift. So it's very crucial the fact that we are rethinking the way we are doing things because we have some kind of new technology that will enable us to do something very, very differently. And together with the culture, we have a set of practice that allow us to continuously improve without compromising, with no compromises on quality, on coherency, on team autonomy. And, I mean, I'm trying my best to, let's say, unpack this definition. And instead of giving you giving you simple examples that can be actually going to the opposite direction because I think that somehow what design ops means can be very different depending from the organization where you are. And I would like to try to deep dive into this definition starting from principles, starting from something that can actually give us or at least I mean, can make us think how we can implement design ops on our everyday work. And I'd like to start somebody with thinking that we as a designers, we need to focus on learning. We need to focus on the capacity that we have to create something that enables our company to be driven by learning, by the flow of information that comes back to us. And then, as a designers, I think it's very important to think about how we can enable other people designers and non-designers to create digital products, to create digital things. And the last one is about connecting two worlds that normally has been separated, has been very, very far, which are the people that are creating the products and the people that are using it. I said before, in the world of Scrum, for normally when the product is released, people, the creators, are already making, making something else. In the design ops, where we have this constant relationship developed by the creators 
and the users, we can actually connect those two things and be continuously uh, inspired by the real usage, by the real cases. So let's go through those principles and let's see what we can find. Uh, let's start from here, so, like design for learning. It means that we can leverage on the power the designer has in order to assess if our, idea, our ideas are valid or not. Design, I mean, the ability that we have to create something and to test it and to put it in front of users is the best way I know to, 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 to assess if a business idea is valid, if there are people here, they, they want to exchange something back. And you might heard about that uh, conducting experiments driven by design is something that might see, it seems pretty easy, right? So you heard probably about stuff like, uh, I don't know, um, uh, design sprints. Well, I have to say that organizing a design sprint on your company is something pretty easy. We tell you, take, you complete your boss to take five people, seven people, to put them in a room for three days, sometimes four days, sometimes five days, and you get a prototype, and you get something. But what is the problem? The problem is that after the sprint, everybody will get back to work, and yeah, let's start again. Because the hard thing is not about creating one experiment, but it's sustaining the pace of creating experiments one after the other, make experimentation of the core of what we are doing as an organization. So it's actually what, what makes hard for us is constantly creating this flow of information derived by, exper by experiments. And that's where Design Ops comes to the rescue. Because the idea is that we should minimize the effort required to create a product, a prototype, or whatever can actually render our intent in order to get feedback. So let's work to reduce the effort necessary and let's start gathering feedback. And we can, because I mean, I think that the best way to know something, to have a good idea, is, that, is having many ideas. Have many ideas and combine them. And the capacity to make this kind, this kind of things real is at the core of the idea of design ops. And I mean, I can be very concrete here and I will give you an example. This is something that people at uh, uh, Airbnb are doing. And you see that people just sketching on a paper how the interface would work, it would be rendered with components coming from the, uh, from the style guide. So creating a prototype, it's a matter of seconds. So it's not about creating a new mock-up, having a dedicated person who will do just that, and then having approval, and then doing another thing, and then the cost of an additional mock-up is going to be measured by hours. Doing things and put them in front of the users. <sighs> Magic. <laughs> and I think that this is somehow very important, also in the direction of enable other people to design. Because I think that's one of the reasons why design is so powerful, is that it, it, it can be actually understood by other people and can actually empower other people to ideate and to test their ideas. I think that sometimes we are spending so much time uh, wondering what is the best way to have successful endeavors. So one of the common problems I find when I go to clients is that, oh, well, we as the designers, what is the best way to pass somewhere into this step to the developers? And I think that the key here is that we should not give them maps. We should not give them, you know, paths that describe exactly what to do. We need to give them compasses so they will find their own way on the ground, close to the problem, very, very close where the action ends. And there are several ways, let's say, this, this slide here describes a bit how a process could be uh, when we are talking about empowering creators, and in this case can be even a team without any developers, to take design decisions on the field. But the key here is that most of this work, as I showed before on the Airbnb example, needs to be automated. Automation and the elimination of technology here is the key to have to spend time 
production time on what is important instead of spending time on doing the, the, always the same thing over and over. We don't have to, we need to automate most of the trivial design decision that we, we need to take in order to create about a sign up form. Sign up form, yes, I mean, we can have different variants, but if you want something that can be tested quickly, you don't need to think so much. But on the opposite, the real problem maybe is lying somewhere else, and this is where we need to put our attention. And the last point here, as I said before, is about connecting users and teams. And this is the only antidote I know to the feature factory. Because this is where most of the people I see are trapped. So the fact that they have, they have this, kind of work, this kind of way of working, which is ticketing, ticket out. They pick something to do, they do it. Then they pick something else, they do it. And sometimes it's called garbage in, garbage out. So yeah, it can be, uh, can be, can be hard to do. Uh, because I think that instead of making things done, what do we need as a creators is producing a behavioral change in our people, in the people that we are serving. And the idea of serving is one of the another element, another key element of the of the design of this idea. And in order to observe the impact that we may have as a creators on the behaviors on the users, well, we need to shift our job, not just on the creation side, but also on the listening part. As I said before, it's a conversation. What you do in a conversation is not just talking, but it's also listening. And this is, should be part, a fundamental part of developing a product, a digital product. It's not just creating mockups, creating artifacts, but also creating challenges, so we can, channels, sorry. We can also create channels, so we can listen back what we are producing. And I mean, I'm talking about very stupid things, like, I don't know, a, a simple feedback form. A feedback form is extremely powerful to connect creators and users of a service. Because I've been here, and this is something very stupid, very simple, that we can implement, and we can actually put in our daily life. Because I've been, I've been working in a team while ago, and one of the things we've been experimenting with was creating a feedback form where we ask the people, uh, what do we missed? Is there something that is missing that you would like to have in this interface? It was about picking and configuring things, it was sort of configurator. And we were reading all the messages that we got every morning after the stand-up. So every morning before starting work, we were going through all the messages coming from our users and see if there were something missing. And if there were something that we can fix quickly. Because most of them are actually something like, oh well, we'll be saying A, hey, option A is missing or whatever. And to conclude, let's say the idea that I mean then that design homes is trying to, to convey, it's trying to, to deliver, is start from the recognition that a digital product is never done. When we are doing, let's say, digital th physical things like a chair, a table, a projector, or whatsoever, at a certain point we need to declare our job done so we can start producing things and distribute it. When we are talking about digital products, it's never done. It's a continuous conversation, it's a continuous uh, advancement that we are doing on the product. And from here, we can easily recognize that design is not just a phase in a process that we do something, then something, then design, then something else, then something else. But it's a sort of widespread ability. It's a capability that everybody should have or should understand in order to make successful products. And the goal of each organization moving successfully into the digital products realm is definitely creating empathy establishing this close relationship between creators and users. So people that are doing things, they are actually able to understand what's going on on the other side of the, of, of, of the barrier, of the thing. So as I said before, those are the principles that I think can describe very good what design, what design ops is. <coughs> Focus on learnings, enable others to design. So our work is not just creating things, but helping people to create things and connect users and team, creating this dialogue channel going back and forth. Because 
only reflecting on how we can do, how can we apply those principles on the field, we can actually get, let's say, the, the realization of what I am wishing right now. So, thank you very much. Thinking pragmatically, we need to have buying from a single stakeholder. 
I mean, you have seen and repeat and understand those things and say, like, well, we are doing additional products and we need to move through this path. We are in a, in a very uncertain space and we need to find solutions or exploring different things. And we cannot have design as a bottleneck. We cannot wait for designers that will prepare tons of mockups before starting production. We need to find out what is the way to make, to, to ship products as fast as we can in order to collect more than feedback. So you have this understanding, you have this vision, and this vision needs to be applied, needs to be demonstrated, let's say, in the field. So instead of persuading, I'm normally taking the opposite approach and say running a pilot team where you're focusing on this and show off results. Uh, one thing that I think about the you know, design and growth is that uh, they usually have to consider the of the bigger design to have a bigger role. So the other thing is that uh, you don't convince them to let go. You convince them to uh, um, you know, empower other people to get you out know, their ideas in order to put it into a mutual conversation. It could be controlled by designers that can be in a similar way, but uh, most of our uh, designers uh, is to facilitate the conversation and to, you know, have it in the right direction according to stakeholders' interests. Absolutely, yes, I completely agree. I think that part of design is definitely uh, spread out the design of the people and facilitating the movement of this world. And I think that this is the key, the essence of what we think, like, what we call design thinking, right? So design thinking is about enable other people to ideate for the real design process. And yeah, it's definitely part of this discussion. But as I said, main take of uh, main take of this discussion is that yeah, we are talking about design systems, cool, but why we have design systems? Because design systems are major in the world. They are definitely allowing us to create things, reducing the efforts necessary to test our ideas, to assess if we are right or not in the real world. I think. That's it? Okay, great. Thank you very much.